Hey YouTube, in today's video, we are going to be doing a line on line teaching through Genesis chapter five. That's the genealogies, the genealogies of Adam. Before we get started, I wanna take a moment to ask you to please hit the like button, subscribe to this channel and turn on the notification bell so you never miss a new video. So today we are going to dig into Genesis chapter five. Genesis chapter five is self-titled, The Book of the Genealogy of Adam. You know, this section of scripture is very controversial and some Christians disagree over exactly what it means. There are some Bible teachers, such as myself, that teach this is a very straightforward, literal, genealogical family tree. Others have developed theories to try and add time to the biblical estimation of the creation date in order to blend the biblical text to better match secular dating method methods and um, anthropology. One of these theories is that the genealogies were telescoped, leaving a whole bunch of them out. I'd like to use some biblical evidence to disprove that the genealogies were telescoped. Um, so we have the genealogies here in Genesis 5. We also have a repeating of them in 1 Chronicles chapter 1. So Genesis 5 and 1 Chronicles chapter 1 match. And you can also get a third witness by going over to Jude 14 that says Enoch was the seventh from Adam. So that's three witnesses saying that these genealogies are straightforward to support a straightforward reading of Genesis 5. And according to this telescope theory that a lot of the genealogies were missing, if we were to put that with anthropology, uh, when they believe man first came into being from branched off from an ape flight creature, according to that time frame, somewhere in the neighborhood of 80% of the names would be completely missing in that scenario which would render the genealogies absolutely meaningless. This is the type of thing that happens when you translate God's word with man's word. Man's word becomes the authority and God's word gets bent and twisted in every which way in an attempt to try and help God out. Other people have proposed that the names in Genesis 5 are not individual people but are rather civilizations popping up around the ancient Near East at that time. Now, I will say there is one place in Scripture, Genesis 4.17, where it says, Cain built a city after the name of his son Enoch. So there was a city named Enoch. But because this is so specific to this one verse in Genesis chapter 4.17, I believe the other names in the genealogies would be specific too if they were civilizations instead of people. This position does not hold water and it's a long shot. Another theory is that the long ages of the lives people lived in Genesis 5 are honorary, formulaic honorary. This camp holds that base 10 numbers as we understand them are a modern concept. And in their opinion, a more authentic rendering of this section of scripture shows the ages to be honorific. So in other words, they honored their ancestors so much that they inflated their lifespans as a way to memorialize them. They give the example that Joseph lived to age 110, which was the honorific death age of a noble Egyptian. However, they overlook that the ages are all over the map. We don't need to help God out by interpreting his word by Egyptian standards. In other words, the question always is, is God's word the authority or is Egyptian tradition? I don't understand how the numbers, the ages could be honorific if Jared lived to be 962 years and Joseph only lived until 110. Does that mean that Jared was honored nine times more than Joseph? It just doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. We also see further in Genesis chapter 7, 
verse 11, that Noah was two months and 17 days into the 600th year of his life. So Genesis 7:11 says that uh, Noah was in the 600th year of his life, specifically two months and 17 days into it, uh, proving that days and months and years and ages were uh, a similar concept to what we have today. So this view does need to be summarily dismissed based on 1 Timothy chapter 1, 4, where we are told, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Because of this edification in 1 Timothy, I believe that this section of scripture, Genesis 5, is straightforward communication. Now, I do want to uh, explore one other view before we move on to actually teach on Genesis 1 through 5. There is another view that says that, uh, so the base 10 numbers as we understand them are not what Genesis 5 is. There's a group of people that believe Genesis 5 is using a base 660 Mesopotamian number system. And even they will admit that they have no earthly idea how it works, so they're not able to interpret Genesis 5 to let us know exactly how old that they were. They just suspect that it's base 660 instead of base 10, and I don't think that there's anything, any evidence to support that other than they want to support some archaeological findings um, to in their mind, prove that the Bible is really talking about these archaeological findings, but it doesn't match up with a secular uh, anthropological dates. So uh, they bend the Bible to try to match better with uh, what the world is saying, uh, according to anthropology, which is based on the theory of evolution. Again, 1 Timothy 1.4 is applicable here. This says, nor give heed to fables, and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. I just wanted you to inform you of these different theories so that you're aware of them, and so you understand why we will be teaching them as literal. With that being said, let's dive right into Genesis chapter 5. Verse 1 starts out with, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam in the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. As you can see, these people were not barbaric, as the evolutionists want us to believe. They kept records, starting with Adam. <laughs> That's right. I am saying that Adam passed this on all the way down to Methuselah. In the original language that people spoke before the Tower of Babel, quite possibly in writing, and or oral traditions that were passed down. This verse also gives us an example of the word day. Here the word day is used in the sense of back in the day when they were created. Day can have different meanings based on context, such as on this day, back in the day, someday. But people debate what day means, usually in Genesis at the beginning of the Bible, uh, because they want to um, try and add more time. So people debate what day means, but it's pretty straightforward what the word day means when you just simply read the passage in its context. Also, this verse reminds us that we are made in God's image and are the apple, the crown of his creation. Verse 2, he, being God, created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Here, we see the furtherance and distinctness of mankind. There are different animal kinds, different fish kinds, different plant kinds, etc. But humans, both male and female, are mankind. We are not ape-like creatures. This verse is a gold nugget because it should absolutely eradicate things such as racism. When we truly understand that we all came from two literal people 
And we did not evolve from an ape-like creature somewhere in our past like the evolutionists, the Darwinians would have us believe. We see that people groups are one race beloved by their creator. We came from two literal people. And then after the flood, we all evolved further. Or we're, we all came from Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three literal people. Verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his, in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. Seth was born to be the seed for the Messiah in Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, because Cain had killed Abel. It's really sad that the first human death in all of history was murder when Cain killed his brother Abel. Verse 4, After he begot Seth, that is Adam, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. This is the very beginning of the population of planet Earth. Adam and Eve were very busy as parents. We do, we do know that brothers and sisters must have married one another at the very beginning. Uh, is that yucky? Well, actually, uh, according to today's standards, yeah, I would say that's yucky. But at this time when creation was just get, getting started... It wasn't because the gene pool was pure and it was God's will to make lots of people to inhabit the earth. We are all distant cousins to each other as human beings. Marriage between siblings was done away with during the time of Leviticus though, uh, probably because of gene mutation issues and there was just simply no reason for it anymore as there were plenty of people to choose from. God started up creation and left a lot of room in the DNA to shuffle and make tons of variety. Look at all the different people groups that are out there in the variety. We all came from two people. God loves variety. There are some awesome articles on this subject through the Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis Ministries. I highly encourage you to go to Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis Ministries to get more information and look into this fascinating subject in more detail. Verse 5. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. This is a very sad day, because the person who originally fell into sin dies, as God had pre-warned him before he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you remember, God told Adam and Eve, the day that you eat of the, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Now, it wasn't on that day, but the day that you eat of it, it will be certain that you will end up dying. I do think that there's a very good chance, though, that Adam and Eve were saved. They tried to sow fig leaves after they sinned and became aware of their nakedness. And that just wasn't good enough. It wasn't something that they could fix themselves. God had to fix it. So God atones for them with an animal to make them close and cover their sin. It has always, through the sacrifice that God provided, it has always been by grace through faith that one is saved, even in the Old Testament. This is a Bible study in and of itself, so I'm going to leave it at that for today. We can talk about that more in the future. But again, I do think that there's a great chance that we will get to meet Adam and Eve in heaven someday. Verses 6 through 17. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. What a big family. 
Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. These verses need no explanation as they are straightforward and literal. Verse 18. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. Wait a second. Back the truck up. I thought Enoch was born of Cain and had a city named after him in Genesis 4.17. Right? Yes, but this is a different Enoch. This one was born to Cain, and the other one who walked with God came from Seth's line. I must admit that I did not know that there were two Enochs until I started doing the research for this teaching. What a blessing! I am constantly learning new things in God's Word. That made my day, and who knows? how God is going to use that piece of the puzzle to deepen my understanding even more as time goes on. You know, the more I learn, the more I realize, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And every time you open the Bible or read through it, God is going to show you something new every time. And it's, it's awesome. Verses 19 through 24. After he, he being Jared, after Jared begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. This verse really transitions from having sons and daughters to focusing on Enoch walking with God. What a beautiful thing. It is my prayer for all of us, me and every one of you out there, that, you, that we would walk with God. At some point, Enoch really got to know God and had a very intimate relationship with his creator. Verse 25. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. Let's camp here for a moment. Methuselah and Adam's lives overlapped and they ran concurrent to one another. So I think the records of people came from Adam all the way to their finalized compilation, which may have been done by Methuselah himself. So all of these people were keeping records and passing them down and there were oral traditions. These were the records of the family history. And they must have been on Noah's Ark, preserved in order for Moses to ultimately get a hold of them. Now, whether they were preserved on Noah's Ark or God supernaturally revealed them to uh, Moses, it's fun to wonder. But there is no doubt that documents existed from the very beginning. I chuckle when I hear people saying the term, well, from when people started keeping records. Friends, if you keep the Bible as your authority, you will see that people were keeping records from day one, verses 26 to 32. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old and Noah, be Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Before we close, I would like to just touch on the long lives lived by these early people. Except for Noah and his family, all of these people died prior to the worldwide flood. Now, I don't know exactly what it was like prior to the worldwide flood. There's some different um, explanations and theories. 
but the world was probably a very, very tropical place, like a terrarium back then. Our environment today is just different. You know, back then dinosaurs would have thrived. So after, after Noah's, after the worldwide flood, we see the lifespans drop very quickly. By the time we get to Abraham, which is only 10 generations down the road from Noah, and Noah lived for 970 years, the lifespan of Abraham was only 175. So for 900 to 175, they went in only 10 generations. Adam, Adam had, must have had genetic perfection when God created everything and called it very good before the fall. As the curse of sin and death came into play, the genetic code started to devolve, have some malfunctions. There were also environmental changes, being that the earth, like I said, was probably like a terrarium before the fall. And as people started to devolve, eat meat, and become exposed to radiation from the sun, and uh, some negative malfunctioning mutations going on, we just don't live as long as they did in the beginning. And because sin came in, I must say that our shortened lifespan today is a blessing. Can you imagine living over 900 years in these sin-wrecked bodies? No thanks. I look forward to going to heaven after my work here is complete, and I hope it doesn't take 900 years. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe to this channel, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss an episode, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.